So it all started for us back in 1984. We were living in Austin and become very much California wine enthusiasts. And we made a trip out to Napa and Sonoma uh, with another couple that was a bit older than us and a little more wine savvy. And we did some amazing things on that trip, one of which would change my life was we got to spend an afternoon with Charles Wagner, the founder of Camus. And it was a rainy day and, and you know, 1984, so we're dressed a lot nicer than people travel you know, to, uh, today. And, uh, you know, we get up to a winery, it's, it, it's wet and it's cold. And, you know, and he basically says, unless we'll go through the vineyard with him, uh, then we can't taste the wine. And I'm sure he's trying to shoo us off. But uh, we were troopers, and about three hours later when we left, we had a whole new appreciation for the blending of, of art and science and agriculture and all those things that make wine so wonderful and not just a consumer product. And then we ended up one afternoon at Folly Adu when it was a little tiny uh, winery owned by a husband and wife that were a social worker and a psychologist. Uh, they explained that Folly Adu meant to be shared delusion. Uh, and we ended up pressing grapes, uh, and then we ended up uh, finishing the trip at Jordan Wine. Wow, that's really yeah. quite a journey. It was. It was an amazing you know, week, and uh, we came home with 26 cases of wine. Post-1984, you know, we did all the responsible things that adults do and went into business and raised our children and all of that, and what we didn't realize is that our passion for wine was rubbing off on our children. We really didn't see it, but it ultimately turned out that way. And our son, Conk, uh, Conk like a conch shell, uh, was changing majors at Texas Tech and decided that he wanted to become a winemaker because there was a brand new viticulture enology program at Texas Tech. And he was one of the first students to sign on for that program. And he ultimately graduated from there and then traveled all over the world making wine. And he's our winemaker today. And then our daughter, Whitney, was graduating at the top of her class with a degree in hotel restaurant management. And Donna saw her future very differently than it is now. Yeah, I, um, because Whitney was gonna go into resort management, I thought my retirement would be five-star resorts all over the world on Whitney's employee discount. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it didn't work out that <laughs> way. <laughs> And about two weeks before graduation, uh, Whitney called and said, Dad, you know, I've really had a change of heart. Uh, I want to go into wine country hospitality, and I know where I want to work. And that's Jordan Winery, because I'd taken her out uh, on a father-daughter trip out to wine country a year earlier to celebrate her 21st birthday. And they really rolled out the red carpet for, uh, for Whitney. Uh, by that time, Don and I had been writing a pretty popular wine blog. Uh, for about eight years called Bacchus and Beery. Our last name is Beery, mm -hmm. hence the name. And uh, we had a relationship uh, with Jordan. So they knew we were coming and they really rolled out the red, the red carpet for Whitney. And uh, Whitney knew set her sights. That was the one job she wanted. About a month later, she had it and she just celebrated her seventh anniversary at Jordan. 2014, May comes around and uh, we've been writing our Bacchus and Beery wine blog for about eight years. And we were getting five to 600 sample bottles a year. Uh, we were really refining our palate and gravitating towards Pinot Noir, which is where our real passion lies. And uh, Whitney, we were staying at Whitney's house, her daughter, with her, uh, her then boyfriend. And uh, Conk had just gotten back from making wine for Kim Crawford in, in New Zealand, literally a day or two before. Uh, Don and I had also had a wine radio show on Voice America. Uh, for a year, a year and a half. And I just had been stewing and stewing. Uh, I was tired of my office job and, and, and the company I had, and I was ready to leave that after 36 years. And I was, got sick and tired of writing about and interviewing people that were living my dream. And, you know, I was young enough and healthy enough and motivated enough. I walked into the family with a cup of coffee and, uh, got them all together at eight o'clock in the morning before Whitney had to leave for work and told them, blank, we're making wine. And it was not met with a round of applause. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> well, you know, my opinion was um, if I'm gonna start a new business with Roger that I'm supposed to be heavily 
invested in financially as well as passionate about the business. Um, just making a mention of it over a couple glasses of wine prior to the public announcement <laughs> would have been nice. Because I was blindsided too. I was like, oh, we're starting a winery. He was so excited. He had an idea and he wanted to go for it and he wanted the family well, to get behind him. <laughs> it's the passion. Well, wine does that. Well, you know, in 2014, <laughs> our first harvest, we made great wine in spite of ourselves because we had very good uh, contracts with great growers. We had some fantastic fruit coming in. The Sauvignon Blanc, we still work with that same vineyard. Uh, it's the uh, land's been in their family since 1856. It was a Mexican land grant. And um, so in 2014, our first harvest, we were learning a lot of new things. And, you know, our son was named uh, the winemaker and he was like, but I'm still doing harvest internships. I'm not ready to be a winemaker. And of course, Roger said, well, you're the winemaker. Figure it out. <laughs> you know, if you, don't, if you don't throw yourself into it, then how do you know yeah. if you're going to succeed? I mean, you just have to go forward. Yeah. I think Roger had the right idea. You do. You just have to jump in. And jump and then look. Is there anything else you wanted to say about uh, starting this whole, this dream of yours, Roger? I mean, you managed well, to have family on board and everybody is all on the same page now. Yeah, so everybody's all on the same page. Uh, we had to figure out the name of the winery. And with our last name being Beery, Beer with a Y, that does not make for a very good winery name. Beery <laughs> Family Wines. <laughs> Uh, so we wanted to have a name that paid homage to our family and uh, our Central Texas roots. And so we named it Jay Cage for my great grandfather and uh, his lasting legacy in Austin, Texas, is that he designed and built uh, the Lamar Boulevard Bridge, Art Deco Spandrel Architecture that he came in 1942 and these beautiful art deco spandrel arches and how they reflect perfectly in what is now Lady Bird Lake. Back in the day, it was Town Lake. The original Austinites know it as Town Lake still, but uh, it's not the bridge in Austin that has all the bats, but it's fairly narrow four lanes and uh, a lot of Austinites would like to see it widen, but it can't be touched because it's a historic place. I was going to say that we were extremely impressed with your pre-event and pre-virtual tasting details. The handwritten invitation to the virtual tasting, the personalized tasting menu emailed in advance, the charcuterie board suggestions emailed in advance. Um, these advanced details really prepare the people that are going to be experiencing your virtual tasting to, to get ready for their adventure. Right. And we do... Um... <clears throat> Not everyone gets a personalized tasting notes. If I have a corporate event, they don't get um, a personalized uh, note. All, all the smaller groups and the personal groups, if I know it's a birthday party, they all get one. Um, it's just too much. I mean, corporate runs, right now I'm sending out between 60 and 100 wine packs a week for my corporate events. And that was just something that uh, we had to let go of. I just couldn't keep up with writing that many notes. Um, but definitely for a small group, they still get handwritten notes. That's people, incredible. You know, after the fact, they get, you know, if they purchase, they get a handwritten thank you note all the time. We do try to do that. You know, we're from the South. We love to write our thank you notes. <laughs> yeah, we got one that you sent for us, which I thought was really nice. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, that's part of it is uh, the beauty of what we get to do now, and especially with these uh, Zoom meetings, is that we're getting to meet so many people and make so many great connections uh, all over the country and it, it's really special. And I think it really helped us, you know, during the really strict um, shelter in place, we felt like we were still at least having some human contact by doing the Zoom meetings mm -hmm. um, and spending, you know, we could spend an hour or two, um, maybe once a day, maybe two, three times a day, uh, meeting people and chatting, finding out what's going on in their life, you know, people from all over the country. So I, would, I think it helped our uh, mental well-being yeah, doing the Zooms right. too. Um, yeah. sure. um, so you specialize in single vineyard wines. Yes. And you're particularly known for your Pinot Noirs. That's correct. So I fell in love many, many years ago with the concept of single vineyard wines. And as you know, all the grapes in that particular wine come from one vineyard. And the way I view that is vineyards are a lot like voices. There's a few that should be the lead singer in the band uh, or the solo artist. 
There's a lot that are great in the chorus or the blend. And then there's even more that probably should never sing outside the shower or outside the car with the windows rolled up. And so, uh, you know, we're able to source from some really extraordinary vineyards and we love working with our growers. Uh, they really like the product that we put out with their vineyard name on it. But what works really nicely, especially with the Pinot Noirs, is each of them have a little bit of a different clonal composition. They're in different parts of Sonoma County. So we've got different Tawars. And they all, while they're definitely Pinot Noirs, they have their own distinct flavor. And when we get a group of like maybe six or eight people, uh, you know, the jury's always split onto which one is, is the favorite. And that really compliments us as far as winemakers, because we know at that point, we haven't been too heavy handed in the winemaking and make the wines all taste the same. So around uh, Sonoma County vineyards, you have a number of areas, the uh, Sonoma Coast, the Dry Creek Valley, Sonoma Mountain, Petaluma Gap, and Russian River Valley. You we have do. vineyards in all of those areas for your wine. Yeah, I will show you a little map here. Oh, good. I was hoping you'd have a map. <laughs> yes. So we, we only buy our grapes from Sonoma County. Um, we buy from all family growers. We don't buy from any corporations that grow wine. Uh, so when people buy our wine, they not only are supporting a small family winery, but they're supporting family growers also. But we do source from all over Sonoma County. Uh, so we only make about 1,500 cases a year of all the wines combined. And uh, if you look at the front of your bottles, you'll see how many barrels uh, that we produce of, of each of those wines. But uh, so here's an ABA map, American Viticulture Area map of Sonoma County. Uh, we'll sort of start from north to south. So Dry Creek Valley up in the northern part is where are the two vineyards from our uh, Craftsman's Blend, which is Sangiovese, Zinfandel, and Petit Syrah, come from two small vineyards here. Our Zabaca Rancho Sauvignon Blanc, which we're going to have in this tasting, comes from the Zabaca Rancho vineyard here. Little Red Star is the cute little town of Healdsburg where we live and are sitting today. We are Pinot Noir Rosé, our Wedding Block, and our Hallberg Pinot Noirs all come from the famed growing region of Russian River Valley. Our Chardonnay <coughs> is Sonoma Coast way down here. You can see the coastal influence. This is the uh, Pacific Ocean. And down here is uh, our Petaluma Gap El Coro Vineyard, which we'll be having a little bit later. And then we'll finish up here on the top of Sonoma Mountain with our Vanderkam. So for people that may not be terribly familiar with our county, uh, along here is the Mayacamas Mountains, or though we lived in Colorado for a while, so they look like big hills to us versus Colorado Mountains. And over here is Napa Valley. So Napa Valley has a mountain range over here as well. So they are actually a valley. Uh, Sonoma is often miscalled Sonoma Valley, but we're not. We only have the mountains here and then we go all the way to the coast. And San Francisco is about 60 miles down here, due south of us. So we are in what's considered the Northern Bay area. Uh, we make our wine at a shared uh, winery facility called Sugarloaf. Uh, we do have a tasting room there that is by appointment only. But I don't really see us going back to doing very many uh, personal tastings. These uh, virtual tastings have been so fantastic and we've been able to reach out and meet so many people uh, and it's so much more convenient. People are relaxed, they're in their home. It doesn't have to be a wine tasting because they've got nowhere else to go but to the couch. Right. <laughs> okay. so. And they don't have another, um, you know, wine uh, tasting to go to. You know, I think people have gotten so comfortable with uh, video meetings and Zoom meetings. Uh, I was reading a thing the other day that says Americans have progressed in their use of technology four years and four months. <laughs> so, so, so we really see this as, as our future and our way to meet people and touch people and share JK wines. So you get to meet people all over the country, really, even beyond the country, even internationally, if you wanted to. Um, whereas if you had a tasting room, you know, you'd be limited to people who could actually 
make the trip there. I mean, this has really opened you up to people maybe they can't travel to your area. Correct. And that's what I was going to say. You know, a lot of people are starting to use it for family get-togethers. It's much cheaper than trying to find, you know, one, one no one really wants to travel right now, but it's, you know, a lot cheaper um, to do a virtual tasting um, with the family members. You know, just last night, we really had a nice tasting with four young ladies that uh, all went to uh, Penn State and were roommates together. And now they're engineers uh, all over the country and they get together uh, every Friday night uh, to uh, recharge their, their friendship. Uh, we've done birthday parties where uh, they brought in mariachi bands to serenade the wife for her 50th anniversary, uh, a concert pianist to, to uh, serenade. Uh, you know, people just get really creative on these, on these personal uh, Zoom tastings. And then we do a lot of corporate ones and they're everything from a corporate happy hour to corporate team building to uh, actually one company we work with uh, uses us as a sales tool. So they bring us on with potential clients and uh, then uh, they bring on one of their uh, 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 very happy clients to do a slide presentation uh, about their company. And then we come back on with more wine and finish up. So, you know, companies and people are being creative and that, that's really fun for us. We do get, uh, as you mentioned, international tasters too. Uh, we're not able to ship our wines internationally, but uh, we have a couple of tech companies uh, uh, that we work with quite a bit, and uh, they will bring on their, uh, their uh, workers or their executives in India uh, or in the UK just to hear what we're saying. So well, Just to connect with the team. So we have uh, what we call our Wine Stain Dream Club. It is uh, totally customizable. It goes out twice a year. Why don't you tell them how it works, Tom? Well, you were doing fine. Um, <laughs> so it's, it goes out twice a year. It's a six bottle club or a 12 bottle club. It goes, uh, ships out the first week of April and the first week of November. Totally customizable, um, which means if it's an inventory, you can have it. You know, I'm a member of about seven wine clubs and I do get a little frustrated sometimes when they say I can customize, but then I go on and I only have, if I don't want the winemaker selection, I only have about, you know, five other wines to choose from um, you know, because those are the wines they're trying to move. So as I said, if I have it in inventory, you're welcome to it. Um, the six bottle club is a 15% discount on all bottle purchases. And we say bottle purchases because we do have some um, packages, the virtual tasting packages are already discounted. So those don't um, get a wine club discount. Um, and then six bottles or more we, is complimentary brown shipping. The 12 bottle club is 20% discount on all bottle purchases um, throughout the year. And that's not only their club purchases, but any reorders throughout the year. Um, they get their discounts. And as long as they buy six bottles, we do ship brown complimentary. Uh, Roger does occasionally run, you know, uh, shipping options that can be as low as three bottles will include the shipping. And that would just be a special that we'd be running. During the summer months, we do run discounted cold ship options. The winery picks up about 55% of the cost of a cold ship, um, which we encourage people to use. It's, you know, packed in, uh, with ice packs and overnighted for delivery of, uh, by 1030 the next morning. Uh, we just encourage that because of the heat. You know, we want to make sure the wine gets to them in good condition. Uh, the recipes, we do have recipes on our website, but wine club members receive the recipes before they're posted to the website. And then we try to say thank you with a little gift to our club members. Since we don't have a lot of local club members, we uh, don't throw big pickup parties. So we, um, when we introduce Chef Nick um, in November, who's our daughter's boyfriend, he is a professional chef. Um, they got a J Cage apron, a black apron with gold embroidered uh, J Cage sellers on it. That was a super popular one. Um, the, the November gifts seem to be very popular because I think it goes out right before the holidays. Everyone's in a festive mood, but we got a lot of pictures of people cooking in their J Cage apron while drinking their J Cage wine. Uh, so that's fun to see all the pictures on social media and uh, pictures that we could use for our social media also. But, um, we have done um, a couple of uh, virtual wine club parties. Um, so we have dabbled in that just a little bit and those seem to be well received. So we'll maybe try to do those throughout the year also incorporate that for wine club. 
members. Yeah, that's so, a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the last one we did a couple months ago, uh, one of my friends, I'm very much into singer songwriter Americana music. And one of my friends is acclaimed Austin songwriter Darden Smith. And, and he came on for an hour and played and answered questions and talked about the songs he'd written, who'd written songs with and stories from the road. And turns out we had a couple of uh, guitar collectors that in the group we didn't know and they all started talking about guitars and it was a really uh, interesting fun fun time i saw on your list too that you help people with their personalized personalized help for their trips to your area and you know basically i give them a list of you know wineries to go to or restaurants that they can um check into um making reservations at some of our favorite then um i let them know which ones i have a little more pull at well, we're joining your one yeah. well. <laughs> that, that's a great benefit so we're going to start with our zabaca rancho sauvignon blanc Yes, so this is from Dry Creek Valley, and the Sauvignon Blanc are the first grapes that come in every year. So this is a really beautifully farmed vineyard uh, right on uh, Dry Creek, the actual creek, uh, which is a bit more like a river than a creek most years. And uh, what makes this special is they grow Sauvignon Blanc Clone 1, which is the standard Sauvignon Blanc clone everybody grows. But they also grow the oldest clone from Sancerre, France, Sauvignon Blanc Musquet. And so we pick the Sauvignon Blanc Clone 1 and Sauvignon Blanc Musquet uh, together. We ferment them together. And then they see about 50% neutral oak, 50% stainless steel. And it even sees a little bit of malolactic to balance the sharpness of the acid. But as you can see, it still has plenty of acid without being over the top like I... I find some Sauvignon Blancs to be. But it also, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc Musquet clone gives it those really nice uh, white peach, stone fruit flavors, and uh, you know, I think a little white tea and melon on the finish. Uh, so it, it's much more of those flavors than, than grapefruit, which quite frankly, grapefruit is best left on the breakfast table, uh, in our opinion, and is not a wine flavor that we enjoy. Well, that the family enjoys. And I think, you know, being from Texas, we like to have our wines um, on by themselves. Um, so we wanna make sure that it's a wine that you can enjoy just a glass of. You know, you come in from after work, sit down and have a glass of wine while you're deciding, you know, what you're gonna cook for dinner or who's gonna deliver your dinner to you. Um, but it, we also want to have enough to, um, uh, acidity for, that it will pair well with food. And I think the winemaking team hits that with every single one of our wines. You know, those of us from Texas, we like to enjoy our wine around the pool, on the boat. And if you're gonna smoke a Tex Texas brisket for 12 to 15 hours, you're gonna get pretty parched. You need a little something, something to sip, sip on. So uh, Sauvignon Blanc, what do you like to pair the Sauvignon Blanc with food-wise? Oysters, oysters. Uh, it's great with oysters. Uh, it's good with ceviche. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it, it goes well with, uh, with roasted chicken, as does the Chardonnay you're going to have next, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, it goes well with uh, crab. Uh, well, so does the Chardonnay. So does Chardonnay. Uh, any kind of Italian white sauce that doesn't have too much garlic, uh, the acidity, you know, cuts it really well. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, I really like that a lot. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we only you know make about three three tons worth. Uh, it is all uh, hand sorted. A distinct minerality combined with Bartlett pear and ripe golden apple, enhanced by delicate flavors of vanilla bean and mom's pie crust with a hint of honeycomb. Dang! <laughs> Dang. <laughs> All those years of writing wine reviews say, yeah. for the blog. The Chardonnay is from Sonoma Coast, so it's, it's one of our coastal vineyards. Cruz Vineyard Chardonnay, uh, part of the Keller Estate, which the uh, next wine you'll have there, Coro Vineyard, is a different vineyard, but part of the Keller Estate as well, Keller family. Uh, this is uh, Clone 4, to be a little geeky, which is also known as the Robert Young Clone. It uh, sees 20% new oak, but it is a barrel that is designed specifically for Chardonnay. 
that is a very low impact barrel. The rest is neutral French oak. Uh, but this wine was interesting because we did ferment about a third of the wine in a concrete egg as a bit of an experiment uh, to blend it back in. And uh, I think it gave it a nice touch of minerality and a bit of complexity that the wine didn't have uh, before we blended uh, the uh, La Cruz from the concrete egg back in. You know, what, what we could tell was that the wine needed something. You know, it, 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 it needed something. We weren't gonna do any winery voodoo, uh, any winery magic to give it something because we're very low impact winemakers. Uh, so we needed to do something and, uh, you know, to take it from being a good wine to a great wine. You know, and this wine is scored very well. It, uh, you know, it won double golds. I believe it was rated 94 uh, by the American Fine Wine Competition. So uh, it all worked out. And then what would be your favorite food with this wine? Oh, I think this would be nice with a shrimp scampi, as long as you didn't go, uh, go very light on the garlic. Uh, lobster and butter sauce, crab. I did a crab uh, the other mm -hmm. night that uh, I just did a quick saute of the crab with little shallots and some uh, butter and little touch of lemon, not much. And we did open the 18 Chardonnay with it for dinner and everyone agreed that that was a good pairing. You know, roasted chicken's really fantastic. As long as you just do a traditional herb spice, don't go, you know, even buy one from the grocery store, just don't get the barbecued one. You know, just go with the regular herb chicken rub. Um, it's nice. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it goes very, very well with seafood because seafood has a little bit of that um, sweetness. Shellfish has a little bit of that sweetness. It goes uh, well with um, scallops, I would think. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I do my scallops, I just sear them in a butter olive oil mixture so they are getting a, some butter texture uh in the um in the flavor, in the flavor. thank yeah. you yeah um so yeah just for cheese uh, butter popcorn goes great with chardonnay cheeses i think this one's really good with brie don't you really think? good with brie um, it, it, it's really nice with a, a gouda mm -hmm. uh, as long as it's not smoked right because those are kind of um they have a oh. lot of uh, creaminess to the mouth feel Mm -hmm. I read somewhere that your bottles and corks are eco-friendly. Yes, yes. So uh, interesting. Yesterday we were um, doing a uh, a tasting with a real estate group out of Boston that was uh, that is very much into sustainability in their building projects, and so they 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 asked this question. So. Yes, so we use uh, the lightest weight glass that is premium glass that is totally re recyclable. All of our vineyards are certified sustainable. Uh, Keller, uh, both our El Coro and, uh, and La Cruz are organic. Our uh, uh, Vanderkamp is biodynamic. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar with biodynamic, that's just think of it as organic on steroids. <laughs> and so, um, so everyone that, that we source from is, at a minimum is, is certified sustainable. Our corks, uh, we can trace to within about a quarter mile of where they're harvested. And of course, corks is a, a cork is a renewable resource. Uh, the bark is stripped from just part of the tree and it regrows. And so these cork forests are hundreds of years old and are maintained beautifully. Uh, and many of them have their own sort of unique ecosystem of animals because these cork trees have been in Portugal in the same place for so long. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we do not use foils. Uh, as, you'll, as you've noticed, uh, you know, all of our bottles, uh, you know, you just see the cork with the, with the J Cage brand on it. And the reason for that is uh, the mining of the minerals that go into the cork that make or in foil that, that make it soft and malleable is a, is, is a really nasty strip mining uh, process. Uh, and when we live in Colorado, there were some of those mines not far from where, where, where we lived, and you can see where the sides of the mountain had just been ripped apart. It sort of sounded like you know, some of the old John Denver songs when he would talk about the, the mine out of mountains. Um, and so uh, foils are not re recyclable, so we chose not, not to use them. Uh, that is 
a popular choice within restaurants because waiters cut their hands all the time trying to get foils off of bottles. And when they have a, a winery that doesn't put foils, they like it. So are foils even necessary? What, what purpose do no. they play? No. No, good. no, they aren't necessary at all. Cork making technology got as good as it is. Uh, you would have seepage around the cork, especially if you were storing wine for a very long time and it started to dry out and the foil would cover up that uh, seepage. El Coro Vineyard, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir. The El Coro Vineyard is in the Petaluma Gap, which is out by the coast. Um, the AVA is named uh, Petaluma Gap. We all call it Petaluma Wind Gap, but that did not make it as the AVA name. Mm -hmm. And the AVA's uh, reputation, the saying is from wind to wine. But it's um, a very windy area here in Sonoma County. It's down around the town of Petaluma. Wine enthusiasts loved it, but uh, the, the most fun accolade was it was voted in the top 100 wines of Sonoma County last year. And there were only 13 Pinot Noirs on that list. And we were very excited to see, although we've not released it, the 2018 vintage of this wine uh, just won double gold and uh, was rated 96. So uh, we have not released that wine yet, but um, uh, it's, it's really gonna be beautiful when, when we do. And that'll, that'll probably get released with our wine club in November. A really beautiful vineyard and uh, that I can show you. Down here is the edge of the vineyard. And this is the Petaluma River that flows out through the floodplain to the bay. And about this vineyard can get quite hot. It's westerly facing hillsides, and uh, it's not uncommon to get well over 100 degrees. And about 4.30 in the afternoon, the fog and the cold from the Pacific River over here, or Pacific Ocean over here, comes rushing up this floodplain and just comes up the river and covers this vineyard. And it's not uncommon to have a 20 degree temperature shift in just a matter of about 30 to 40 minutes. So, uh, you know, the heat sort of toughens up uh, the skins and then the cold preserves the skins and the acidity. Uh, and it makes for a little bit thicker skin uh, Pinot Noir than we see in some of our other vineyards. And I think that leads to uh, the spiciness uh, that makes this Pinot Noir just a bit unique. It must be nice to make these wines to your own taste able to make it just exactly, I mean, personalize it to your own taste. Well, you know, we do personalize it to the family's taste, but we do keep the consumer in mind also. You know, we need to be able to sell the wine um, and make it to where it's palatable to many, many different um, customers. But, you know, it certainly, um, it certainly it speaks to our palate because if I don't sell it, I have to drink it. So, <laughs> so I want to make sure I like the wine. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it does allow us to really give it the handcrafting effort it needs because, uh, you know, we're only making 150 or so cases of this wine. So we're not trying to create a wine that appeals to the mass market, but uh, Pinot lovers, uh, you know, really love this wine and, and other people do too. We find Cabernet uh, lovers really enjoy this Pinot Noir as well. But it, it is very rewarding to be able to make the wines the way we want to make them. Pinot Noir doesn't lend itself because it's such a delicate and complex flavor. Doesn't lend itself to a lot of oak. It's very easy to be overpowered by oak. Uh, and if we're gonna source from these beautiful vineyards, we wanna let the vineyards sing. We wanna let them speak. And if we use too much oak, then they're getting overshadowed by the base, if you will. And uh, we want those voices to sing. Because I feel that as a red wine, you can drink it all year long in any temperature. All our Pinots uh, goes great with pork dishes. You know, here in California, the saying is pigs and Pinot. This one we paired a few weeks ago with a roasted uh, lamb roast. Uh, excuse will, me, smoke, smoke. Smoke, uh, it will roast. set you free. That this wine delicious. and a smoked leg of lamb. Oh yes. Uh, We're coming to your house. We'll be there in about eight hours. <laughs> we have to drive. That's okay. We'll get. It'll take that much time to get smoked. <laughs> okay. um, 
So and it goes well with duck. It also pairs very well with mushroom dishes. You know, mushroom pizza, mushroom takeout pizza, mushroom risotto, uh, a woman on a tasting the other night. Um, I just noticed they were doing the all Pinot tasting. Uh, this was well, about a month ago. And, um, you know, all of a sudden I noticed they were just really noshing down on something and drinking the Pinot. And then all of a sudden they looked up and said, oh, sorry, you said it went well with mushrooms. And I just happened to have some mushroom pate in the refrigerator. And I thought, I didn't say anything, but I was like, and they're like, it's delicious. And I was like, well, good. I did a good food and wine pairing and may I come live at your house? <laughs> you happen to have mushroom pate in the refrigerator. But I bet there's a lot of other really <laughs> dummy things in there. Yeah. So I want to come live with you. Um, and I think maybe, you know, I just thought about this. I haven't paired it, but you know, like a homemade cream of mushroom soup might be good as long as it's not too, too heavy on, on, on the cream. Um, I'll have to try that one out. That one just popped into my head the other day on a tasting. So I haven't really done that pairing. Yeah. All of that is good, but for me, it's lamb and duck with this wine. And pork. And, and pork is like good. Pork, but you like the lamb and duck better. Yeah, well. yeah. I, I, it, 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 the spiciness in there seems to pair a little better with the gaminess that you get in either lamb or, or, or duck. Okay. So I was out uh, Friday in... Uh, oh yeah, let's, we're gonna show you how Harvest, how harvest is coming so, along. Okay. So we were in our Vanderkamp Vineyard. Uh, so this is Pinot Noir. So here's our little grape cluster. It'll, they'll get much bigger, but they're just like little BBs right now. You see, they're still very green. If very, you were to very bite tart. Into them, very tart. And then we are starting to have a little um, changing of the color or abrasion. So you can see some of the grapes are starting to turn purple. Once this gets, abrasion gets a little further along, and this is more consistent through the vineyard, which it was not, uh, we're about seven weeks away from harvest. So that's when we start planning our calendar. Um, also during harvest, I'm in charge of arranging a lot of the, well, I, I arrange the grape transports if the grower does not bring it in for us. Um, some of our grow groups will, will truck it to the, a winery for us. So oh, yeah, you can go out and, t and, and taste the grapes and check the bricks level and do all of that oh, yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then it's, you very, it's, it's very glamorous. First we go out and start taste, tasting the grapes, just, you know, Picking grapes off. And then once we decide we're getting. Um, and we're testing bricks you know, with our equipment. Right. Uh, but once we decide it needs to go um, to get some lab testing, to get some really accurate numbers, Roger will go out with a Home Depot orange bucket. <laughs> Which, which even, this is how all the wine Even do. big wineries use yeah. Home de Depot orange buckets. And he'll clip the clusters of grapes. He brings them back to me and I hand crush the grapes to make juice. Um, and then we pour it through a kitchen, a kitchen little handheld strainer into a measuring cup. We taste the grapes, we pour it into the test tube to go to the lab. It's very, very fancy. Um, and I call it, I always post on Facebook that the J. Cage mobile laboratory has been deployed. It's either the back of my SUV or the back of our Jeep with all the equipment um, in, in the back. And the first year I did it though, I made the mistake of, you know, it's, it, was, it was hot that year. I made the mistake of I'm crushing the grapes and I was getting a little sweaty. So I did this, all that sweet grape juice is now in my hair and the bees. I now know how to do this or this. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, was, that was a hard lesson to learn that day, but um, I, just kept, I just kept on doing what I was doing because you've got to get the work done. Uh, as harvest comes, this, this comes uh, out of local delivery and becomes the uh, portable lab. Yeah, and I, I tell you, um, that Jeep is known all over Sonoma County. So uh, before we leave the Pinot, uh, I'd like to talk about it a little bit. So we get asked the question a lot, the difference between Sonoma County Pinot Noirs and Oregon Pinot Noirs and of course French Burgundies, which are Pinot Noir. And uh, we're a little warmer growing climate than Oregon and a bit more reliable growing climate than Oregon. So sometimes Oregon has problems with uh, uh, grapes ripening. Burgundy has those problems too. Oregon can have issues with uh, late early rains or late season rains. Uh, that cause all sorts of problems. Uh, and those are really sort of unusual for us. And uh, we get a bit more heat. So our 
wines in Sonoma County have a tendency to be a little richer and a little riper, uh, a little more fruit forward, if you will. Craftsman's Red Blend, and that's 50% Sangiovese, 40% Zinfandel, and 10% Petite Syrah. So Zinfandel and Petite Syrah come, they're picked together. Uh, they come from the Mounts family vineyard um, in Dry Creek. And the Sangiovese is Susan Lentz's property, um, and that's on Bradford Mountain. And it looks exactly like Tuscany. So you can see how steep this is coming down and up here. This is a fun vineyard. Um, I think I find it more fun than Roger because when he's out field testing, I get to take the Jeep off-roading um, <laughs> because you have to walk up and down the rows. You can't cut through you anywhere. Yeah, you uh, and they're quite anywhere. long, the rows. So he'll start at the top and you know, go down our row. So he's gonna be now at the bottom of the property. And I get to drive the Jeep down, which is a lot more fun than him walking down. <laughs> Vandercamp, the Sonoma Mountain uh, Vineyard is a an amazingly beautiful vineyard also. Um, you, you're up at 1400 elevation. It's just, it just feels magical being up there, you know, with the fog and, um, well, you're above the fog line, right? Yeah, so and the so, fog comes in and the valley below. And, and it you, just- You it's, see the Maya Camus Mountains, yeah. you know, that separate us from Napa. Mount's Vineyard is very pretty also. Yeah. And Mount's Vineyard is only about a mile from the San Giovese Vineyard that we just showed you. Up in Dry Creek. Up in Dry Creek. So they're kind of up there also. And it's just it's so so pretty to be up there in the morning. But anyway, let's move on to our red, our <laughs> so red, our the red, red blend. blend. Yeah. And the side of him. Um, so you don't do too many blends, do you? We only do the one blend. Just the one blend, okay. The one blend, and it was a happy accident. You gonna tell mm. us about the accident? We'll tell you sure. about the accident. So, you know, if you remember back uh, in the, the origin story of JK, there was a bit of a communication gap. So this is now 2016, you're drinking the 2018 version, but the 2016 version had a bit of a communication gap as well. So uh, I came to Donna and said, hey, you know, I found this amazing, Sangiovese vineyard uh, up on top of Bradford Mountains, beautiful. It's just like Tuscany. You know, I love Sangiovese, which most people know is also uh, uh, Italian Chianti grape. And so I said, I want to make this wine. It's going to go great. And uh, this is a special vineyard. This is a great opportunity. Let's make Sangiovese. I love Sangiovese and Chianti also, but we're a pain in a warehouse. No. Okay. <laughs> So then a couple of weeks later, I'm having drinks with my friend, David Mounts of Mounts Family Vineyard. And uh, he said someone had uh, skipped one of their contracts and he has this beautiful, you know, 90 to hundred year old old vine Zinfandel. He goes, man, if you want some, you know, this is the year to take it. And I said, man, that's gonna be good. And they grow Petite Syrah, which is off, also often blended a little bit with Zinfandel to give a little backbone pepper spice. And they grow Petit Syrah as well. And, you know, as you know, Petit Syrah and Syrah are not related at all. And if you've mm -hmm. ever seen a Petit Syrah cluster, there's nothing petite about it. It's like this big, it's, they're, they're just enormous. It's the worst field testing we do because I'm only five one and I have little hands and I have to take that great cluster and squeeze it into the juice. And it's just so big. <laughs> it's just huge. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and you have to get all the grapes because in a cluster that big, they ripen unevenly. Uh, so, so you gotta make sure you get juice from all of them. But anyway, I go to Don and said, you know, we can do this, it's gonna be great. This, I, I can make a beautiful wine from this. And? I said, once again, I love Zinfandel and I adore working with the Mounts family because we'd worked with them before. And I said, but once again, we're a Pinot Noir house, no. So, you know, a couple, three weeks, four weeks go by and we're at the winery and San Giovese shows up and a week later, Zinfandel and Petit Syrah show up. So I didn't listen very well again. And we made those wines and they turned out to be quite nice. Mm -hmm. And we were blending barrels with uh, Adam, our consultant at his uh, kitchen table. And so I know, you know, a lot of people see all these uh, sexy pictures of how things go in the vineyard and 
and stuff. But, you know, a lot of it, you know, we're farmers first. It's, it's real stuff. So we're doing blending samples nine, 10 in the morning at the kitchen table. So we get to the two sample bottles for the uh, Sangiovese and the Petit Syrah Zinfandel blend. And Adam holds them up and says, what are we gonna do with these? And I said, now mind you, I'm not on the winemaking team. I said- By her choice. But by my choice, yeah. And I said, after a couple classes of wine last night, I thought, what if we blend them? Let's blend them. Adam, who's very, very Zen-like, super calm, through harvest at all times. Well, we won't know if we don't try. So we blended it and we all really, really liked it. Of course, Roger had a few tears in his eyes. I could tell across the table because now it's like, wow, she and Adam are now going to gang up on me. She, I'm not going to get, she, she's gotten, I'm not going to get my wine. She's gotten Adam on her <laughs> side. Oh. <laughs> but when we did blend them, we all agreed that it was a one plus one equals three. Uh, and it's a unique blend. Uh, those are wines that are not normally blended together. And we released that in uh, 2016 at a private event. Uh, 2017, 16 vintage, at a private event uh, in Austin. And uh, our, as Donna has mentioned many times, so, you know, Texans love Cabernet. And we get asked all the time, love your Pinot, when are you going to make a Cabernet? Well, we're not. <laughs> I always tell them, we're not a cab house. <laughs> and, uh, but this really seemed to suit their palate. As, a, as an easy drinking red, red wine. And uh, we sold the heck out of it. Uh, we thought maybe it'd be a one and done. Uh, I told Donna that I think she created a monster. And, and I said, yeah, I don't think I'm one, one and done. Uh, the 16 was good enough in 18 to win um, a, <clears throat> a gold medal at the San Francisco Wine Competition, which is the largest wine competition in the United States. They normally get, you know, seven to 8,000 bottles. Um, to judge. So we go back to the, the um, same two vineyards. We say, so sorry, we took a year off. May we come home? And they said, yes. So we made the 18 and we also um, made a 19, but the 18 was good enough to win at the San Francisco Chronicle in January this year, a double gold medal. Roger, I think when you said it was an easy drinkable red, I think that's true. I think that really sums yeah. it up. Yeah, it goes very well with any Italian food. It goes well with a hamburger. It goes well uh, with, you know, a smoked brisket, as long as it has a dry rub on it. Being from Texas, we're all about dry rubs um, on our uh, barbecued and smoked meats. We don't use sauces. Um, yeah, it goes well with binge watching. Part of the thing that's special here is they get to taste with the owners. It's not just a tasting room person or the tasting room manager. 